Hi, Josh. All right, Mr. Chairman, I believe we it is five o'clock and we are ready. Okay, I guess I'd like to call the November 10th, 2021 uh, Design Review Committee work session to order. We have one item of business tonight. It's DRH 21-00144. Josh? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just take a moment here at the beginning uh, to introduce a new staff member we have. Um, Chelsea Weiss is uh, an administrative assistant. She is performs in the same capacity as Nikki. Um, so you will likely see her at potentially this meeting, planning and zoning meetings, uh, historic preservation meetings, setting up, helping us coordinate all of that. So I just wanted to welcome Chelsea and, and say thank you. And we're glad to have her. Yeah. Welcome. welcome. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, DRH 21-00144, uh, you may recall, uh, you saw this item back in May, uh, on May 12th at the Design Review Committee hearing. Uh, it was a proposal for um, a significant downtown project at the corner of uh, 4th Street in Idaho. Um, that was approved subject to conditions. Uh, it was subsequent, that approval was subsequently uh, appealed to Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, in September, the Plan and Zoning Commission denied that appeal. Uh, the applicant proceeded to prepare uh, their application materials in order to meet the conditions of approval. Uh, and as such, they have submitted uh, the documentation for the work session tonight that addresses uh, condition of approval 1H uh, in that original approval from May. That condition of approval required that some additional details be provided on the project. Uh, it was a, it's a fairly complex and large building and obviously a lot of uh, details to consider. So exterior materials details, uh, including samples, um, have been provided for the work session tonight. Um, additionally, details uh, of the locations of the VTAC units, uh, some specifications and some drawings of those uh, have present, been presented tonight. Uh, exterior lighting plan, uh, including photometrics, um, some kind of dark sky renderings that are in the packet of what the building may look like at night. Um, a master signage plan with uh, proposed locations and types of signs is also in the packet. The applicant has received a final ACHD staff report, which was included uh, regarding the location and configuration of the alley. They did uh, determine the details of that alley construction and, and how that would take place. Um, and then finally, any design changes as a result of design development. And you will see tonight that some changes have been made uh, to the design that address some of those concerns at the initial hearing and the subsequent appeal. And uh, we'll go through those tonight. So in terms of the proposed exterior materials for the project, um, the applicant did submit some more detailed information about what those materials are, including physical samples that are here tonight. Um, one major change is that the uh, previously proposed um, uh, GRFC panels uh, have been replaced with a <coughs> metal panel. There was some initial concerns about the quality of appearance of the GRFC. Um, they have moved to a metal panel to um, provide a material that's consistent with downtown buildings. It has that smooth, refined appearance uh, and the questions about what the texture of those have been resolved by that. Um, additionally, they've submitted brick samples, um, samples of the proposed painted steel tubes, the paint colors, um, all three colors of the metal <coughs> panels uh, are, are here tonight as well. And also some glazing samples uh, for the committee's consideration as well. The um, second piece and, and some slides here depicting those exterior materials, I think with the physical samples here in, in chambers, um, those are probably much more helpful uh, than, than these pictures are. The VTAC units, uh, they, and I believe that display is a little dark on the screen there, but they did detail the locations of those DTAC, VTAC screens, uh, the ventilation panels there provides some specifications uh, and locations of where those would be located as well. The exterior lighting for the building, uh, they did submit a photometric plan um, in the packet that details the lighting levels at the exterior of the building on the ground level. 
and then some renderings of what the building could potentially look like at night. Um, I would look to the applicant to kind of discuss in detail a little bit greater about what the garage lighting ends up looking like. You know, we will have some some light uh, in the garage where it is not screened uh, that will be that would certainly be visible on those upper upper levels. And then also some uh, large openings at the alley, right? That there, there will be a, a substantial uh, lit opening um, at that alley for entrance uh, that I believe is, is not depicted in these slides. So I would ask them to kind of address what that lighting looks like there. The master science plan that was submitted uh, gives some prototypes uh, and location, potential locations for signage. Um, there is a non-lit sign uh, to the east facing the large residential project. Uh, and then the re remainder of the elevations uh, use a, an internally lit and halo lit uh, sign uh, in various locations. And then there are identified places for other signs as the project progresses uh, and tenants are identified. They don't have those tenants identified at this point. Um, I would point out that signage is dictated by the zoning ordinance. It's based on zone. Uh, sign applications are just an administrative approval uh, that, that would be one of the final steps uh, of the development. There is a, a certificate of a occupancy required um, before you can even apply for a sign. So it's really one of the last stages. And it's just, it, it's just per the square footage uh, allowed in the C5 zone, uh, which would be 20% of the wall. Finally, those uh, design changes as a result of design development. Uh, I think there's some significant things to point out that were also included in the packet. Uh, this is a cross section of the alley showing the height of the garage screening, um, showing that it will, the, the solid um, spandrel panels on the, on the garage will screen vehicle headlights. Um, and then it shows some heights and clearances on the alley there. The most significant change is on the east side of the building where there was a fair amount of discussion and concern about the screening of the garage uh, on the south portion of the project. Um, there was always residential units proposed on the north half of that east elevation. And now on the south half of that elevation on the southern tower, uh, the garage is screened by residential units uh, that they were able to include. Uh, the floor plate of the garage was modified and narrowed in the east-west direction, and that picked up some, some floor area to include uh, those residential units. So from the east side of the building, there will not be vehicles uh, visible. Uh, that and it's a little bit difficult to describe, but in terms of it's really this area here, those are all residential units now, uh, completely screening the garage. So that was a significant change in response uh, to testimony at the public hearing and, and as a result of the design development of the building. Um, with that, um, we did, staff does feel that the applicant has submitted uh, a materials package and revised and enhanced drawings uh, that meet the conditions of approval of the of the initial application. Uh, we would recommend approval of these work session materials tonight. And I would stand for any questions. Thanks, Josh. Uh, any questions for Josh? Not right now. This time I'd uh, invite the applicant forward if you wanna present. Jeff, if you'll give me just a moment, you will rejoin uh, as a panelist. All right. Well, thank you, members of the Design Review Committee. Uh, Jeff Wardle, my address is 251 East Front. I appreciate your time tonight. We do have Jason Bates uh, from, Jason Butler from uh, Cushing Carroll tonight. 
to uh, be there together with other members of our design team. I appreciate the ability that we can do this remotely as, as I am traveling and unfortunately not able to be there with you. I believe that staff has done an excellent job of identifying the materials that have come in. As, as we discussed in May, you know, as we all know, for these types of complex projects, there are significant changes that happen in the design process. And the input that the commission that the committee provided to us was considered. And as we went forward with additional modifications uh, and additional refinement of the design, certain certain of those elements came together. And we believe we have a, a better project now. So I'm going to briefly share my screen uh, so that. just to highlight before I turn it over to Jason. So as Josh indicated, uh, the condition of approval that you adopted and imposed in May desired that we come back to address these six items, uh, exterior materials, the location of the VTAC units, exterior lighting planning, master signage, configuration, finalized ACHD conditions of approval, and design changes as a result of design development. So as Josh indicated, there was an appeal and planning and zoning denied that appeal. So tonight, uh, as a result of the revisions that have occurred in the design process, we have modified the exterior materials on the main tower to replace the GRFC with, uh, with metal panel to address the concerns Josh identified. We worked with ACHD on a configuration of the alley uh, that was acceptable to them. It will not be, there will be no excavation of the alley, although it will be redeveloped uh, to address utility needs and drainage within the structure, but there'll be no elevation gain. And as a result of that, the height of the first, of the, the lowest parking deck elevated slightly, and we'll talk about the consequences of that later. But as Josh indicated, the garage was, uh, modified the floor plate of that, narrowing the floor plate, and, and then it also facilitated us increasing the amount of residential by incorporating it in the South Tower. So along the North Elevation, our landscape and design teams will be able to address that as we have further refinement, but uh, Virginia Creeper has been abandoned and we've identified additional alternative green greenery that will be used as the elements of landscaping there. And we further refined the plan to address those issues. As Josh noted, it has always been the plan uh, and always been the design that there will be, you know, a 42 inch concrete, concrete panel uh, at each level, shielding adjoining properties from any vehicle lights and that there's approximately 30 inch overhang as well that provides screening from lights, mechanical and other systems uh, below each floor. So as we look at the east elevation, as Josh indicated, this entire east elevation is now residential. So it is the same glazing that is utilized. We'd always contemplated trying to keep the same shape of window and same lines of the design, but that has all been replaced with a, an additional 25 units of residential use, uh, alleviating that problem and those concerns. And as Josh depicted, uh, you know, there had been there had been statements made that neighbors were concerned that this was going to be like some of the other garages downtown and it, it is not uh, that there is in fact concrete panel that provides the buffer that has been identified and most importantly we think with the modification to the elevation uh, to address the issues related to the alleys configuration at at the alley on fourth street it is 26 feet, eight inches from the top of the panel on the first floor down to the elevation of the sidewalk. 
So with the retail elements, with the design elements, with the other things that we've done on the first floor, objections and concerns related to the pedestrian experience on, on the various street frontages, we, we think have been adequately addressed. I mean, 26 feet, eight inches is a significantly higher level of, of the top of that than you're gonna find in some other garages in downtown. And as a practical matter, you know, pedestrians just are, are not going to, to notice. It's not like some of the other garages that you see. So with that, uh, we, uh, well, the only other point that I would make is, you know, we've disagreed fundamentally with the objection that, and the argument that all four elevations have to be identical. Uh, we don't think that that's consistent with the design guidelines and the downtown Boise design standards. You know, we have utilized a variety of screening materials and screening types and screening designs that are appropriate for each and every one of the elevations. And that's used metal screens, that's used metal panels, we're using concrete panels, you know, the greenery and landscape elements do that. And most importantly, the residential elements screen entirely of uh, the garage from the Imperial Plaza to the east. So with that, I'm gonna turn the time over to Jason Butler to walk you through the some of the more detailed elements that you've identified and, and requested. Thank you, Mr. Wordle. Thank you, Jeff. Jason Butler, 800 West Main Suite, uh, 800. Um, Chairman Marsh and committee members, thank you. Uh, we welcome this time together and really it's uh, about a bit of a dialogue. I'm gonna move through the uh, materials here real quickly as, as Mr. Wardle uh, described. Um, if we're able to allow uh, Brad Dunbar from our office to, to share screen and, and uh, we're benefited by uh, some technology anymore and the uh, Revit model that's uh, really maturing and taking shape, but we'll spend a little bit of time in the SketchUp model as we pull it up. But, we're fortunate to be joined by a, a number of our, our design colleagues as well. Should any questions specific to landscape, the lighting, uh, we're joined by, by uh, our civil engineer, uh, mechanical or uh, electrical engineer and, and landscape architect tonight too. So looking at the tower, uh, the North Tower, uh, the office tower, um, or the South Tower, I apologize, uh, looking uh, lightest to darkest material in an insulated uh, metal panel. Um, yeah, Bob's holding it up here for us. So uh, you see that panel that wraps uh, kind of the element to the uh, to the east tower, side of that tower, and then over the top. Uh, so um, moving to the next uh, material. And again, these are all insulated metal panel. Um, you see the the band work at the at the floor lines uh, in a in a complementary but a, a darker element. And then um, that's also uh, anchored by the vertical elements that have always uh, really been part of the design um, in, a, in a, a bit lighter shade or a darker shade of material. And then with an infill in between uh, panel four to panel five in a black band. That's a quick run around of the insulated panel product. Um, really beneficial from an energy standpoint, from a lightweight, durable material that's well accepted uh, within, within uh, our downtown community. Uh, down below at the garage level, uh, precast panels, we're, we're utilizing uh, um, uh, a very attractive uh, textured gray material uh, in this uh, sample that's before you with uh, a, a light, uh, um, a bright white uh, uh, steel product in a, in a really a bright white uh, product uh, uh, finish in a powder coated finish, real, real very durable material. And then the glass, the other chief material on the tower, uh, uh, um, the clear um, anodized aluminum frame and then a, a clear, clear uh, solar band 77 product. So very ener energy efficient, does have a little bit of a green tint, uh, but it's a, it's a clear glass on clear glass uh, by, by definition. That's a quick run around of the uh, move through of the exterior materials on the office tower. One thing that's unique uh, looking at the, at the base of the building, as Mr. Wardle described, the building is, is unique and, and does respond to each of its respective elevations. 
Uh, you'll see the shading, uh, the plant material and a bit of a shading filtering material on the garage levels. Um, in, a, in a durable product, um, the, the drainage, yeah, or the, uh, right there, Bob. Yeah, so the planter material in a, matching the precast element um, of the garage and is a, is a planter that's um, located inboard on those precast panels. So easy to maintain. And again, a durable application in, in that regard. Moving around the project to the, to the North Tower and very different architecturally, but similar materials. Uh, so the North Tower is the multifamily working uh, darkest to lightest now uh, let's let's go to the black panel the dark panel and and that's really a fallback uh, kind of a backdrop material you see it on the north elevation um, uh, reliefed back in between some of the lighter panels that allows us to integrate as you saw in the earlier exhibits the the vtac louvering uh, works very seamlessly within the system and and really kind of uh, disappears into it if you will and uh, we're able to color match that, you know, exactly. Uh, the next uh, panel stepping down in color again, um, the office tower is, is a <laughs> supply chain challenge. Uh, we've got a small sample here rather than the 12 by 12, but uh, you see uh, that uh, capping element where the cursor's moving back and forth and then in a vertical fashion. Again, a little bit of a hint to that office tower uh, in a vertical fashion with that, with that number four panel color. And then uh, moving uh, to the, the next panel color that's uh, up and uh, before us here um, is the, the corner element color that's right there in the cursor. Uh, you see that anchoring kind of the corner elements within the multifamily building. And then the lightest panel, uh, where we don't utilize the white on the multifamily product and, and, uh, and pro portion of the pro project, but um, uh, a, a complementary, uh, a little bit, um, a panel with a little bit of color versus the white in it. So that white is allowed to be a very special element within the office product and, and tower. Um, moving down in the model, just real quickly, we are utilizing the application of brick and really we're fond of this brick color. It's been part of the application all the way along. It's down low in the product, uh, the materials and, and the projects, um, down on the park element that runs north south, if you recall through mid block portion, um, down where it's, um, you know, a, a great uh, material that's uh, tactful, that's approachable, that's uh, very warm and, and durable and, and will withstand uh, the elements certainly down low within the building. Uh, we do have a little bit different frame color from the anod clear anodized on the office tower to the uh, multifamily, so a darker frame color. And, uh, and we do have, uh, a, a, again, a, a dark element, a little bit uh, more of a residential type window system and, and so on. And we apologize for not having a, a larger corner sample of, of that, but I believe each of us as professionals can maybe visualize that a bit. We do utilize a wood grain panel um, down low if we drop down towards the entry of the multifamily. And again, this is off Bannock Street, kind of that mid block at the park. Uh, we do have a, a wood grain metal product that you see uh, anchoring the, the under, underhang, the overhangs of the building, and then certainly warming up that uh, um, multifamily entry. And then let's move down the street, down Bannock to the uh, garage portion. Uh, again, a little bit different take on the garage here. Those planters, similar system on the office side, but an outboard application uh, enabling us to, to give a little bit of variety and uh, utilize a shading element that, that will integrate into the, uh, the drainage structure and the, the planting uh, medium uh, that's, that's suspended outboard the building and uh, will mount and, and be very successfully mounted into the, the precast uh, barriers that you saw in the earlier exhibits. The, yeah, let's move up the, yeah, there we go. The, the, there was a lot of dialogue on the uh, previous uh, submission and a lot more refinement if we, as we zoom in on the, the, uh, uh, balcony elements. So we've chosen and proposed a 
very uh, a, a random weave, but a very tight weave to obscure those balconies and, and any furniture that, that may land out on those balconies. Also really enables us to, um, versus a, a horizontal element like we showed before, just the concern of, of uh, kids or, or uh, tenants uh, climbing uh, up the, those elements and so on. So uh, really nice, uh, very, very uh, rich, uh, uh, a nice product proposed for, for those balcony elements. And again, a black frame, powder coated frame um, around those balconies. Yeah. So that's a quick move around the, uh, the exterior of the building and those, those um, materials. Brad, could we maybe switch over to the Revit model real quickly and want to do a better job of explaining. We do probably the most significant, as, as, as Josh had indicated, most significant refinement. Um, we gained 25 multifamily units along the way since uh, this, this group is, uh, your group has seen this last. And so as we zoom in to perhaps, uh, I know you guys don't go into plan all that much, but uh, wanted to share a little bit more information on the, the five units on levels two through six that were gained. Um, this was done uh, for a number of reasons and, and largely as staff, uh, as Josh had characterized to, to respond to the neighborhood and the, the uh, um, uh, concerns over that material that we originally proposed any light leak and, and uh, so on to the, to the east of the project. So you can see the nature of, of the units that were, uh, that were uh, uh, gained, so to speak, which, is, which was a great thing and widely uh, uh, accepted and celebrated by our team. The elevator core also simplified. I don't know if there's any questions or we wanna get into that. Certainly in Q and A, we can get into that um, if, if, you, if you so choose, so. Um, some uh, of the other highlights and refinements, uh, we did uh, gain or, or drop out a, a stair tower uh, with, the, with the five units that were uh, located on the east side of the project. So wayfinding becomes a little bit better, safety, security, uh, all of the important elements for a project of this nature and scale uh, were, were really gained and, and some benefit there. Um, we did narrow up the, the uh, parking and the access to two lanes into the parking garage versus the three that were originally proposed. And, and again, uh, in, in uh, working with ACHD and, and that group. So um, we've uh, met the alley kind of design uh, criteria and the clearances and, and uh, heavy work being done right now. And as you could imagine on trash and, coordination in that regard and, and uh, utilities uh, and, and the city's been, been um, fire and, and so on have been uh, very, very accommodating of their time uh, in, in the way the building's planning out and, and just the overall development of things. So I think with that, we'll uh, kind of wrap down and gain a little bit of time here so we can get deeper into the work session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler, Mr. Wardle. Questions for the applicant from the committee at this time? We've got one couple quick ones real quick, uh, maybe Mr. Butler. On bottom side of the balcony finish, I know since those are kind of visible from the street, I don't know if that's uh, something that's been identified yet. On the residential side, just the underside. With the underside of the balconies yeah. themselves? Yeah, maybe if we bounce back to uh, the uh, SketchUp model. And uh, so we're anticipating and detailing that towards a, a, a steel structure, a bolted on exterior uh, uh, balcony enables us to keep the, the um, um, energy, you know, the energy uh, code compliance of the envelope intact. Um, it doesn't integrate uh, directly into the structural floor system, but it does bolt into the system. Um, all pre, you know, powder coated uh, precast or uh, powder coated uh, steel system, with the with the integrated stainless rail is is uh, is is what's uh, illustrated and being detailed. Does that just be like open deck painted dark color or something on the bottom side then visible, or is there a soffit material or? Yes. Uh, so uh, a solid a solid. Uh, 
deck topping material. Um, and uh, I don't know the exact specific name of the product that we're looking at right now. Um, but yes, it'll, it'll be, uh, there won't be internal drains, but it'll, it'll drain to the exterior of the building and uh, not be a transparent um, uh, material, so to speak. So I don't know, Chairman, if that Yep. No, I think that responds to you. <laughs> that helps. I think on the uh, office tower, there's a green band at the ground level. Is that? Yes. Is that yeah. Apologize. Uh, yeah. So that is, uh, okay. that's a spandrel panel. Uh, again, really that signature green that the uh, Idaho Central Credit Union uh, 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 has uh, part of their brand. And, and so that's a, that's a green spandrel product at the, at the, at the branch of the credit union. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Me for the applicant? No? That, Mr. Chairman, yes. Can we look at the east elevation on the south tower? Okay. Very good. Um, and the are the Five floors above the, the broad white band is are those office spaces or apartments? Those are multifamily. Multifamily. Okay. I noticed that where you've provided a lot of exterior opportunities for mm -hmm. the balance of the apartments in the north side, this side seems sort of devoid of any kind of that opportunity. Is that just because of the nature of those? units that they're they're going to be priced in that way yeah committee uh committee member uh, zabala it does offer us a bit of a different product departure uh potentially there in the in the um the apartment owners um it, it, again really utilizing the the tie end of the tower and the office tower and respectful of that but it does it does as you uh perhaps hint at there, it does offer a bit of a, a different product and, and different finish. And again, we're working through those interior details right now. Okay. Um, now I get this is a, it's a question and it's, uh, I think the answer is obvious. On the photometric pieces that you showed, obviously that's the site light. Uh, yes, it's really not how that, these buildings are gonna look at night. They're going to be illuminated with what's ever on the other side of the glass. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it, I I don't know where I'm leading with that. Other than I think if the concern was what are these buildings going to look like at night with lighting, that the the graphics provided solves the one question. It really doesn't really answer what they're going to look like at night between when you put the signage on them, which is one or more or other, and then what's happening on the back side of them. So. Uh, I just want the neighborhood to know that, that it's not what you see in the picture. Other questions for applicant? Mr. Chair? Yes. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate that you guys took the effort to continue the, the visual continuity of your South Tower with the residential units. I'm just wondering if you could uh, explain the decision on the Western side to step away from the, the visual look of the South Tower and have uh, just empty space between the, the precast panels in the garage. Do we wanna to move to that, around to that side? Yeah, there we go. So that was in uh, an effort uh, to really uh, establish that, uh, the landscaping element and recognize that Fourth, Fourth Street is a, a landscaped uh, street, street and corridor. It also um, lightens the building up a bit at that signature corner of the of the credit union, um, and and allows us to really maintain a naturally ventilated parking structure and and not start to bring you know uh, more enclosed type elements uh, downward into that garage. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, that is um, within that vein, and and this might be a personal preference, but I uh, disagree with. Mr. Wardle on the decision to uh, vary the, the looks on your garage mass on every side. It uh, doesn't seem like you guys had much of a, a massing model that you were really going off of to maintain integrity here. Um, you know, you, you just told me about 
the the landscaping on Fourth Street, and yet you you had the opportunity to to, to take what was on Bannock and put that on Fourth and on Front, and went away from that. Um, that's just another decision. I just would love you to walk through as well, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, Please, if yeah. I may respond to that, I mean, I think we need to go back, uh, committee members, and remember the guidance that was given by the city council in their approval of this application. And with respect to Bannock, council member Clegg had identified her desire that we provide some of this green type treatment that we had on the west elevation on the north elevation towards, towards the Jefferson. The city council, uh, the city council, that was the concern. The neighbors had a different interpretation of that. The planning and zoning commission on remand evaluated that. And if you recall, when we originally submitted this, the intention was that these boxes are interlocked and that they are projecting through each other with the garage. As we've gone forward with the design, part of the rationale for this is that originally we wanted the tower to come all the way to the ground and carry that forward. And so the solution that was provided at the time was to do that and to do that with that green, with that green element. So, at the direction of the city council, we carried that green element around to the north elevation, but there was never once direction from the city council or the planning and zoning commission or this body in the Mar in the May hearing that somehow these different elements were inappropriate. And in fact, the planning and zoning commission denied the neighbor's appeal who argued that the same green treatment should be handled all the way around the building. So uh, I understand the concern. I believe that this is a design element that has been uh, fully vetted by this committee in May, by the Planning and Zoning Commission on Appeal as everyone interpreted and applied the city council's direction that was given to us in March of this year. There is nothing in the Boise City Code or the downtown design guidelines that require all the elevations to be identical. In fact, the direction is, is that we should use modulation, we should use facade treatments, we should do other things to soften that and to provide those structures. And so from the very beginning, Cushing Terrell had a vision of how these interconnected boxes that serve different purposes, an office purpose, a parking purpose, a retail purpose, a residential purpose, each has a different and distinct purpose and a distinct design. So I, I understand the concern, but we have done exactly what we've been directed and I'm not going to second guess our architect as to why they committed to this design element there on Bannock 18 months ago when we first initiated the application. I'd like to clarify. Um, I certainly uh, think that the, the element on Bannock is the strongest of those elements. Um, and I certainly appreciate your original concept of the interlocking masses. I, I think that's commendable. Um, I don't necessarily agree that it was fully executed here, uh, but that's not really here nor there. Um, I also don't believe that it is city council or planning and zoning's uh, scope to be judging aesthetics. I think that's this body's role. And I think that design has changed in the time since this was originally seen. So we're evaluating it now, right? Um, I've given you my judgment and that doesn't necessarily hold for everyone. But that is; those are my concerns. Thank you, Member Hersted. Other thoughts, questions from the committee for this, Mr. Chair? Yes, um, I guess <clears throat> I wanted to clarify a little bit with uh, Committee Member Hersted. Are you? You're, you would be. You would think it'd be more appropriate if that vertical screen element that's carrying the vegetation was also included on the Fourth Street. 
elevation? Is that instead of the gap between the concrete and the next? Yes, I, I think the element that screens on Bannock uh, ought to be employed on the garage on 4th, as well as on Idaho, where okay. it intersects and protrudes out from the other masses. And I, I guess I could see where there could be a little bit of a variation there with the, the planters on the 4th Street and Idaho side, I think, are inboard of the exterior wall as a, a, opposed to the Bannock Street side that are outboard of that, which I think maybe, I mean, I'm, this is my opinion that that was chosen just because of that treatment, because it's harder to get something to grow up interior to the building as opposed to the exterior. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see that they've in, increased the number of planters on the Bannock Street side, because I think before my concern was that to get the vegetation to grow high enough would be problematic. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify that for myself while, you know, considering your comments. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Simple. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Uh, uh, I'm not a landscape architect, so uh, I can understand the, the north side and the climbing of the ivy on the trellises or the screens that are there. What uh, with the inboard planters is the uh, would it be the same ivy in those planters cascading over the face of the spandrels? Uh, Commissioner Zavala, I'm not a landscape architect by any means either. We're joined by Greg Barrett. No, the the materials are different, okay. specific to the exposure and and so on. So, Greg Bear, one zero six seven four North Stage Hollow. Uh, so I'm the landscape architect on the project and uh, no, the plantings on the 4th Street section inbound uh, are intended to grow up to help screen so the view into the garage and some will also grow out and drape over the wall but I won't see. grow necessarily up the wall. I see. And what, what, what is that planting? What's the viability of that planting being inboard and less exposed to sunlight i guess or whatever yeah uh, that was that's a valid concern it was a concern of ours in the initial design we feel that with the west exposure it's going to get enough sunlight in the later hours of the day that it'll have enough uh, exposure to the sunlight to to grow <clears throat> adequately is that does that answer your question yeah, yeah that's fine thanks other questions for the applicant You know, thank you very much. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify on this item tonight? Please come forward and if you wouldn't mind, please state your name and ad address for the record. Yeah, my name is Dan Everhart. I reside at 200 North 3rd Street in Boise. Uh, that makes me an immediate neighbor um, to the project. And I just will remind you as I've done every time I've spoken on this, I speak on behalf of myself as a neighbor and a resident of downtown, not as a representative of the Idaho State Historical Society where I'm employed. Um, I think that, I, first of all, I, I hope this can turn into more of a conversation, a conversation that in, includes the neighbors, not just the design uh, team and the commission. As these dis matters are discussed, we have opinions here that I think are valid in this conversation. I hope it's a conversation and not just a hearing. Um, we're appreciative of some of the changes that have taken place in the design. I think these are changes for the best and I, I'd like to credit the neighborhood uh, with, uh, with seeing some of those uh, changes proposed. The, the changes to the material, for instance, the, the stucco was a totally inappropriate suburban material. I'm glad it's metal now. I, I, devil's in the details, I hope it looks great. Um, and of course, the change of use from garage to residential units fronting on the east, which will totally change the look and feel of that tower uh, as viewed from the east, much appreciated there. Um, I think there are a couple things. Uh, Commissioner Zabala um, took length to note uh, that the photometric uh, drawing was or illustration, let's call it, was not really indicative of what the building will look like at night. We understand that. And we're particularly, uh, we're particularly concerned 
that the four large rectangular openings on the first floor, that is two garage entries or exits and the entry and exit to the alley are not described in any way as anything more than a black void. Uh, we know that those, we assume that those will be lit 24 hours a day. Uh, so unless they're not going to be, unless they're gonna be um, black all night long, it's not a very good uh, interpretation of what the actual building will look like. Never mind that there will be on and off lights in the commercial and residential units. We expect and anticipate that. Um, Lord knows we turn our lights on and off too. We just don't generally leave them on 24 hours a day. There will be similar uh, light pollution from the garage levels, um, which are not totally shown that way either. So there will be these horizontal strips of light, again, not illustrated, but presumably on 24 hours a day. Um, so at the very least, it'd be nice to see uh, an illustration of what the building will look like um, when we have these large rectangles on the first floor uh, and these horizontal strips on the south, west, and north elevations. There is something that no one's really spoken about, and I guess it's a matter of code. Mm -hmm. It's concerning that there will be potentially 15 places for signage on the south elevation, 12 places for signage on the west elevation. I sent Josh some photos. Uh, there are no buildings in downtown Boise that employ this Times Square billboard style uh, design uh, element. And it is concerning. Now, luckily, the east and north elevations have been spared those signage um, panels. But this, dare I say, is a tacky application um, of signage. At least it could be. Now, if they only use a handful, so here's, they, they mentioned three mm -hmm. projects, right? This is one project. So we've got, we've got a couple signs there, you know, on the corners, right? That's the Grove. That is Times Square, right? So not our residential neighborhood. That's, that's Boise's Times Square. Um, there's another view of the Zions Bank or one of the other ones, Josh. Um, and, and you'll see in no application, um, certainly none that they illustrated specifically in their, in their letter, are we seeing the kind of outsized number of signs. Zions Bank, sure, we got a big Zions Bank. Sure, we've even got a big Holland and Hart. Not on all four elevations, by the way. And then when you want to detail the individual tenants, what do we get? We get a blade sign. We get a blade sign on 8th Street and a blade sign on Main Street. Those include individual logos for individual projects, right? Buildings, businesses. But nothing like the 15 signs or 12 signs here. Um, and they included this in their list, Pioneer Crossing. This is the most suburban, of course, of their um, downtown projects. And it is the most signed project. So there you can see four large signs with um, graphics. And uh, that's only four signs on one elevation. But we're going to have 15 on the south elevation and 12 on the west elevation. So I'm very hopeful. Here's, here's my last illustration. I love this building, Pietro Belusky. Uh, it's a beautiful example of modernist design crumbed up with these beautifully bright colored logoed signs. Um, this, of course, is not their project, um, but I think it gives you an idea of the detriment that over the top signage can have on a project. So I just mentioned that. Lastly, um, I would just want to talk briefly about this business with the vegetative screening. I, I, think, I think they understand we've never asked for there to be strict uniformity, elevation by elevation, but equal treatment of the screening of the garage. Not uniformity, equal treatment. And um, we're thrilled that there's going to be apartments on the east side that will block the view of the garage. I think our friends and neighbors on the north side continue to have concerns about the long-term viability of those plantings to screen the north elevation. How will that be achieved? There is 
some staggering on that north elevation. So there will be places where you see no plantings, right? Because they're not uniformly across the across the elevation; they're just staggered. So, um, never mind the poor east, or sorry, poor west and south elevations that get much less, um, you know, screening. So, so I'd ask you to consider those. I'd love to continue to participate in the conversation. I don't know if it's appropriate, but it seems like there's been lots of talk, and I. I'd like to engage in that conversation if that's if that's what we're having here as a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members? Yes, please come forward. And if you would, please state your name and address for the record. So my name is Cindy Schaffield. I live at 200 North Third Street. And I'm not as eloquent as Dan, and I don't have all the uh, details. But I do have a question. I think Mr. Savala brought it up, that in the tower that they just added, there's going to be some new apartments and there was no balconies. And I think that's a total disservice um, to the people who are going to live there. If you're gonna live downtown, um, I personally have a hard time even seeing the Juliet balconies at the Gibson. I think the balconies on the other side are wonderful. People need to have balconies. They need to have access outside. So if all those um, different sides of the parking garage are gonna look different, why not the first five floors have some kind of a balcony? I just think it gives more life, more vibrancy to the to the building and to the people who actually live there. They're not just in a cage with windows. They actually have somewhere they can go out, get some fresh air to their house. So that's just my concern about that tower. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public wishing to testify? Josh, any online? Okay. And once able, if you would please state your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Bob Snyder. I live at 200 North 3rd Street, Boise, Idaho. Members of the Design Review Committee, Thank you for allowing me to testify concerning the proposed Idaho Central Credit Union Plaza. I'd like to compliment Idaho Central and BBA uh, in the changes they made to the easterly elevation to eliminate the visibility and light pollution from the parking garage. This change will help maintain the livability of over 30 Imperial Plaza owners facing the tower approximately a half a block away. With Idaho Central acknowledging the light pollution from the southerly tower, I'm surprised and I'm concerned about signage on the easterly side, which has been proposed with a 17 foot logo and four foot high signage that I understand would be illuminated. And like Dan mentioned, another unidentified sign. The major signage could be installed on the other sides of the building. And Dan emphasized what that is. And I totally concur with his comments about the importance of not over signage and trying to make this blend in as much as it could into the neighborhood. All, all major residential multi-story buildings on the south and on the west side would not have the close lit signage that potentially it would be on the east side. And then the other concern that I have is, I think it's incredible about 25 more dwelling units going in downtown in this building, but what open space has been increased for that? I mean, it's very minimal with just the one 20 foot strip going on the east side of the building, you're adding 25 more units. And if it stays with no balcony, there, there is no open space for them. It is just crowding the downtown area all the more without improving anything. Once again, I've offered in all my written communication oral presentation in reaching out to BBA and Idaho Central to assist in any way I can. I've not been, I have not received any interest from them in working together for a project which I think could benefit the existing homeowners 
rental tenants and corporate interests. Thanks for your consideration. And I urge you to de deny the signage on the building in favor of a more friendly and uniform plan. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members? Yep. And uh, when you're able, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Susan DeSelthorst. Uh, I'm an owner at 200 North 3rd Street. And uh, I just, I would like to thank Dan, Dan for all of his work. I think he really speaks pretty well for all of us. I, I had no idea about the signage and that would really make a, an inappropriate building even worse. My big comment though, is that I think that there's a lot of people who aren't at this meeting tonight because the card that was sent by the city is super confusing and told us that it was beginning promptly at 6 p.m. So I, uh, I, I, I think that a lot of people have missed out on this presentation. I missed the beginning of it. So I don't know what was ever decided about um, the trash situation and the alley. Um, and those are kind of my questions. I do feel that um, as was the earlier stated, we asked for equal treatment, not the same treatment. So I believe that um, that was that was an overstatement by the attorney that uh, of what we were asking for and what was denied to us by the Planning and Zoning Commission. That's really all I have to say. Thank you very much. Josh, are there are others online that are wishing to testify tonight on this. Hearing none, any other members of the public wishing to testify tonight? If not, I'd uh, invite the applicant up for any rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure Jason will make himself available to answer questions, but I just wanted to, to weigh in on a couple things. Uh, first of all, you know, with respect to signage, the direction was to come back with a sign application. Now, as Josh pointed out, this is not the time or place for a final sign application, but we appreciated your desire to see how the signage would work. ICCU is the anchor, the owner, the developer of this project, hence their signage is going to be important. Their design elements are important. We have committed to the neighbors as set forth in the design, as set forth in the signage uh, plan, which we will finalize with staff later, that the signage on the east elevation at the top will not be lighted. So Mr. Snyder's concern has been addressed and we've been consistent in that regard. To the extent that yes, we did identify multiple locations for signs, it does not mean that there will be signs in each and every one of those locations. As Mr. Everhart went through our portfolio and identified those other locations, as we know from experience with the city and in adopting and getting a signed plan approved, that the use of boxes to identify potential areas where signage can be permitted consistent with the code is the mechanism that's been done. It's been utilized that way, not because it's intended that each and every one of those boxes will be filled with a sign, but if we've not identified a location, we have to amend the plan before we can obtain approval. Additionally, with respect to lighting, I think uh, we understand the concerns, but we also point out that the original conditions of approval and the requirements of the city of Boise have very specific limitations as to how bright lights can be and what we have to do to do that. We've obviously provided cut sheets identifying the various types of lighting, the fact that they are not going to have there will be no drop lighting that we can shield and cut those off and, and use those elements to address those as we go forward. But ultimately we have to comply with the standard that is required and we will. So with that, uh, we believe that we have satisfied the conditions of, of approval. We believe that we've satisfied and addressed the items that you ask us to go and work on. We have made throughout this project significant modifications to this project based upon reasonable suggestions and reasonable requests from the neighborhood. Obviously, there, there remains, a, 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 it appears, a difference of opinion, but with that, we believe that we've satisfied those concerns and those requirements. Ultimately, our lighting application and the lighting design elements will have to satisfy the existing conditions of approval, 
The signage will be evaluated through the further process and we will be in a position to move forward on that. So Jason, I will defer to you for any final comments. Really don't have anything further unless there's further questions by the by the committee. Any follow up questions for the applicant at this point from the committee? I had Mr. Yes, Chairman, so, sorry. Um, yep. Jason, just a couple of questions real quick, um, following up on some of the neighbors uh, concerns. The Are the new multifamily units, will they, I'm assuming they'll have at least some sort of operational windows. Um, I know they don't have balconies. Um, I thought there was potentially an outdoor space on the roof, potentially on the north tower. Is that available for outdoor space for residents for, of all of the multifamily That's aspects? Correct. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Simple, for bringing that up. There's there's uh, generous rooftop amenity space on the seventh floor deck that's available to all 125 units within the within the multifamily pro project. Yeah. Um, the park space is very thoughtful and and being uh, well protected from um, utility infiltration into that area and and that sort of thing by the design team is. Is certainly first and foremost in our mind to create a, a really a beautiful mid block park pocket park and a north south mid block connectivity uh the, that's available to to the public okay. and certainly the users so okay. um there there will be operable windows by code uh, yeah. with those units and and so on yeah. okay thank you that yeah. clarified it for me yeah thank you mm -hmm. Thank you all. Uh, after consulting with Josh, I think because we're going to have some deliberation between on the on the committee here, um, and the regularly scheduled hearing is uh, basically ready to start. We're going to table our deliberation on this till the end of the hearing tonight. Pick this back up. Any questions that we have for uh, the applicant and internally to the committee at that point in time. So, with that, we'll table it till the end of the this particular hearing tonight and. Uh, at this point, we will start the regularly scheduled hearing for um, November 10th, 2021. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, distributed a, a potential consent agenda earlier tonight. Had a couple, had a few items for deferral, one for consent. So um, we could start into those and. Uh, and we'll uh, hear a couple of items and jump back into the work session and pick things up there. Good. Well, with that, I'd like to call the November 10th, 2021 Design Committee meeting to order. And with that, Victoria, will you please call the roll? Marsh. Hi. Zavala. Here. Aguilar. Here. Simple. Here. Kristen. Here. Five present, two absent. Great. Uh, first thing, we uh, looking for a motion on the October 13th, 2020 minutes. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Bala. I would move for approval of the Boise City Design Review Committee meeting uh, hearing minutes of October 13th, 2021, as submitted by staff. Moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Mr. Chair. Yes. I was not at the last meeting, so I'll abstain. Thank you, Mr. Second. Mr. Chair. Yes. I'm in the same boat. I was not here at the last meeting, so I'll abstain from the vote. Understood. Any others? With that, uh, Victoria, please call the roll. Marsh. Aye. Sabala. Aye. Kirsten. Aye. Motion carries three in favor. Next item are deferrals tonight. There are four items to be considered for deferral. Um, the date specific on the deferrals, do you have that, Victoria, by chance, what next month's date is? I do not, but Josh might. Well, we will follow that up in just a moment. Josh, you know next month's date off the top of your head. So. That is, uh, Mr. Chairman, December 8th. Was that December 8th? Thank you. 
Uh, the first item to be considered for the, um, to be deferred is item number one. It's DRH 21-00238. Uh, it's located at 521 Front Street. It's um, for the construction of a new 19-story mixed-use building with the ground floor commercial and 209 residential units. Um, are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item that cannot make the December 8th date? Online, please virtually raise your hand. Anybody look here and see none? I will move to the next item to be deferred, which is item number two. It's DRH 21-00378. Location is 6259 South Pleasant Road, Pleasant Valley Road. It's for the construction of a new uh, 1,080,000 square foot uh, warehouse distribution center with 98 truck docks. Is there any member of the public um, or audience wishing to speak on this item who cannot make the December 8th date? Virtually, please raise your hand. Seeing none, this item will be considered for deferral. The next item to be uh, considered for deferral is item number seven. It's DRH 21-00409, location is 2506 West Targhee. It's for the construction of a new four-story multi-family residential building with 50 units. Um, are there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item who cannot make this December 8th date? Anybody virtually raise your hand? Being none, this item will be moved to on the uh, deferral. Uh, last item is item number eight, DRH 21-00411. Location is 951 East Gallon Road. For the construction of two new industrial buildings totaling approximately 885,180 square feet with associated site improvements on the property. And again, is there any member of the audience wishing to speak to this item who could not make the December 8th date? And that concludes our items for deferral. And with that, I would look to uh, take a motion on the deferrals. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I move that we defer items one, DRH 21-00238, item two, DRH 21-00376, Item seven, DRH 21-00409. Item number eight, DRH 21-00411 to the December 8th, 2021 Design Review Committee hearing. So moved. Second. Second, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Victoria, please call the roll. Marsh. Aye. Sabala. Aye. Aguilar. Aye. Semple. Aye. Ersted. Aye. All in favor, motion carries. We have one item to be considered for a consent agenda tonight. Uh, for the record, I will be abstaining and recusing myself from the vote for my professional relationship to this project. But that item to be considered on tonight's uh, consent agenda is item number six. It's DRH 21-00410. Location is 3140 East Barber Valley Drive. It's for the construction of a new two-story building totaling approximately 11,500 square feet with associated site improvements on a property located in an SPO2 zone. Is the applicant present? Is that the record show the applicant is present? Are you in agreement with recommended conditions of approval? That the record show the applicant is in agreement? Are there any members of the public wishing to testify in opposition to this item tonight? If you are virtually raise your hand. Seeing none, this item will be moved to the consent agenda and that concludes our items to be considered for a consent agenda tonight and I would be open for a motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that item number six, DRH 21-00410 be approved on the consent agenda uh, with all the terms and conditions contained within the staff report. So moved. And second, thank you, Mrs. Rob Sabala. Any discussion on the motion tonight? Mr. Chair? Yes. I need to recuse myself from this uh, item. My husband is a principal at CSHQA. Okay, thank you very much. Other items? Hearing none, uh, Victoria, please call the roll. Sabala? Aye. Simple? Aye. Ersted? Aye. 
Motion carries three in favor, two recused. Okay, thank you. So the first item to be heard on, on uh, tonight is item number three. It's DRH 21-00369, location is 111 or 1115 West Idaho. It's constructed a new 27 story mixed use building with uh, 297 residential units, ground floor retail and lobby space and seven floors of structured parking located in a C5 DD zone. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Josh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I'll be um, fairly brief uh, in my presentation. Uh, the applicant is in agreement with the conditions included in staff report. Uh, we are expecting some public tonight to testify on the proposal. And I do have some uh, public comment that was received after the packet went out to present to United tonight as well. So the applicant has proposed a 27 story mixed use building uh, on the southeast corner of Idaho and uh, 12th Street in downtown Boise. Um, both folks would know it as being in the parking lot behind uh, the record exchange. So the proposed building uh, does take up the uh, majority um, of the entirety of the block between the alley and uh, Idaho Street uh, in a north-south direction and then extends from 12th Street uh, to the rear of, of the aforementioned uh, record exchange building. Um, they do have an alley for access to parking, loading, uh, bicycle facilities, and service areas uh, with residential entries uh, and streetscape uh, improvements proposed uh, on 12th and Idaho Street uh, for the project. Um, the ground floor uh, does have a large uh, retail uh, area that it does not have uh, disclosed tenants as of yet, but that could be utilized for a number of of uses allowed in the downtown zone, such as restaurants or small scale retail. Uh, again, on the ground floor, there are loading uh, areas for move-ins for residents. There's a trash room, uh, there is a bicycle room, and then there is the, the ramp and the entrance into the parking garage. Um, the parking structure is on floors two through seven, uh, extending up above that ground floor uh, active area. Uh, and then above the and above that, it transitions into the residential tower. Uh, the project does have 297 residential units. Um, the project has been broken into kind of a base, middle, and top, with the parking garage uh, being uh, illustrated with a decorative metal screen with some graphic elements that mimic that at the top of the building. Uh, that middle area of the building is that residential tower area um, uses a uh, glass curtain wall system uh, with balconies uh, that are used to break up those those areas that tower is set back um, from you can see in the uh, east west elevation here that tower is set back from the parking structure uh, as required in downtown design guidelines they do dictate tower setbacks above the sixth floor um, the applicant requested as part of the application to be granted a uh, deviation from that standard to to not step the tower back until the seventh floor until after that parking garage. Uh, the findings for that uh, in the design guidelines relate to um, scale of surrounding buildings uh, and respect uh, to privacy and setbacks from from surrounding buildings. We did find that that um, deviation requested to, to not step that tower back to the seventh floor is compatible with the scale of surrounding properties uh, and does it does accommodate that parking structure in orderly fashion with that residential tower above. So we recommend that that be granted. As mentioned, the top of the building has a very strong graphic element uh, that the application materials describe as being an homage to the Sawtooth Mountains uh, with, um, with an angled top and then some rooftop amenity space that takes advantage of that stepped building top to provide a couple of diff a few different tiers of activity, if you will, and then uses a, a large mechanical well at the highest point of the roof uh, to hide the mechanical units for the building. I think that's shown fairly well here in the in the section diagram that you have the cooling tower uh, enclosed in the mechanical well here. here and then some some stepping of amenity decks uh, taking advantage of that of that sloped roof. 
uh, some illustrations of the proposed building, uh, this one being from Idaho Street, um, and then a, a closer kind of ground level view as well. As mentioned, the applicant uh, was in agreement with the conditions of approval. Um, we did receive a uh, public comment after uh, the packet was distributed, um, expressing some concerns uh, about loss of views uh, from a resident uh, in the residential project that is located to the southeast of this tower. Uh, and then kind of pointing out a couple of, of questions that I would just like to just quickly address. One is, is City of Boise's reaction to property values. Um, my response there would be that the City of Boise does not assess or collect taxes at Data County. Uh, so we do not have any purview over that. Second being restrictions on working hours of the project. Uh, in the project report, uh, in the conditions of approval that the applicant has agreed to, there is a restriction on hours of construction. Uh, that is condition 15 and construction activity on the site is limited uh, from 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, so that would address that question. Um, with that, uh, the applicant is present, uh, has a presentation uh, prepared uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to them or, or take any questions that you have for me. Great, thank you, Josh. Questions for staff at the moment? Seeing none, I would invite the applicant forward to uh, present. And if you would please state your name and address for the record. Sure, Jeremy Malone with Aqua Number Development, 877 West Main Street, Suite 700, Boise, Idaho, 83702. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I would just like to um, first off say thank you for seeing this project. As you know, Oppenheimer Development has a long history in downtown Boise. Um, we're very passionate for our community and the, the needs of our community in downtown. We have partnered with a group out of Chicago, White Oak Realty Partners on this, which we're very excited about. Um, they've got a long history of um, high rise projects in downtown. So it's a good mix of our local knowledge and relationships with their, um, I guess, history of construction methodology. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our architect team, SCB Architects, and have them kind of go through a little bit of the project. But I just wanted to say thank you very much for hearing it. And we look forward to working on this. Hello, my name is Nolan Sitz, and this is my colleague, Lindsay Von Zegger, and we both like to testify and present our project. We're with SCB Idaho, located at 95 Yesser Way in Seattle. We're representing the Oppenheimer Development Corporation, White Oak Realty, and Ponsky Capital Partners. Thank you for your time, and we're excited to present 12th in Idaho. Um, if you have any questions as we go through the slides, please feel free to interrupt as we go. We broke it up into three parts. Uh, one is context and some influential drivers that drove our design. The second no, no, is- No, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. If you could just move the microphone up and get real close to it. That way we can hear you. Sure. Moving. Thank you. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. And um, we broke it up into three parts. One is context and some influential pieces that drove our design. The second is the exterior expression. And the third is we wanted to give you a tour of the inside, starting at the very top and then working our way down. Uh, the first slide over here is an aerial map of Boise. Our site is the red rectangle at the intersection of 12th and Idaho. Um, as Josh pointed out, we're in the C5DD zone, so our height and residential FAR is unlimited. Um, and as a tall building, we have really spectacular views to the foothills and the green belts. Uh, at the street level, we have very convenient access to the bus line on Idaho, bike trails along the river, and we're within walking distance to much of the retail services civic and recreational spaces the city of Boise has to offer. Um, we love the Boise skyline um, the mix of taller and shorter buildings, modern and historic and the backdrop of the foothills makes the view incredible any time of the year. We also like how urban Boise is, very walkable blocks with lots of restaurants and retails that spills out into the sidewalks. Um, and the green belt is just a couple blocks away, perfect for biking and kayaking. Um, there's a lot of vitality and energy to the city, and we only wanted to add to that vitality and energy. So for 12th in Idaho, we drew our inspiration from the Sawtooth Mountain Range. 
not only the shape of the mountains and the jagged edges, but also what it feels like to be at the top of the mountain, whether you're looking out in the distance as a vista or down below at a lower plateau. The experience at the top of the mountain is like none other and something we wanted to explore in our building. Programmatically, the building is made up of 297 units spread across 18 levels, 377 parking spaces at seven levels below in the podium. At the top, we cherished it and created a two-story mini deck with vistas to the south, east, and west. For us, this began to recreate the experience of being up on a mountain. Not only do you have spectacular views in the distance, but you also have views down to the floor below. Uh, below that, we added individual balconies for units that give the building some texture. Lastly, we sculpted the top to create a jagged edge of a mountain, merging the two terraces together. We added a bend in the plan of the building to give it more shape, and in turn, it helped to break down the scale of the building in the east-west direction. Urbanistically, we wanted to just highlight a couple items. Uh, the sawtooth edge creates a very iconic top. And we're located in between two office buildings, so a dense residential tower with retail at the base, on-site parking, we think will help make this neighborhood feel more mixed use. On the downtown design guidelines, a couple highlights, the parking structure is concealed, we have a distinctive top, middle, and base, and we have really simple articulation at the balconies to break up the massing. Looking at the building from the other side, uh, the tower is set back 15 feet from the alley, 10 feet from uh, Idaho, uh, and it's 15 feet from the interior lot line. This is a conceptual rendering at the top of the building, showing two and many levels, two decks, and exterior staircase that ties them together. We want this experience to feel like you're on top of a mountain. Programmatically, the lower deck is intended to be more of a social gathering space with a pool, while the upper deck is more private and secluded with a fire pit. Both will have interior spaces that support the exterior decks. And visually, we think the silhouettes of a mountain at the top is stunning, especially with the foothills as a backdrop. And this is a conceptual rendering of the tower. You can see the top taking the shape of a mountain you can see the bend in the floor plate, two thirds down the, the tower, and then balconies on all sides help break down the scale and create some movement in the facade. Parking is wrapped by a screen wall, and we have an active ground floor with retail and residential lobby. At the very right hand top, you can see a section at the top of the building with the elevator overruns and the cooling tower, and we're doing our best to kind of conceal all that mechanical equipment at the top. Moving into the plan a little further, um, here are the residential floors of our project. In the typical plan on the left, we have 17 units per floor with a diverse offering of unit types from studios, one bedroom units, one bedrooms with dens and two bedrooms. These units raise in, range in size from 500 square feet to 1100 square feet. At the top of the building, we have larger three bedroom units, and these units are perfect for people with families or people that just want a little bit more room. Uh, moving down further to the parking, um, on the right is our typical parking floor plan. We have 90 degree parking, two way circulation, and two sets of elevators. The center set of elevators is for residential use. And then up at the top corner in blue is the public access elevators. Then filling out the rest of the corners of the plan in yellow is bicycle storage, which will meet our, our bicycle requirement of one per unit. Um, looking over at the perspective, the parking encompasses the levels um, on the left. Um, so moving down a little further, the parking is covered with a graphic silhouette that plays off the sawtooth at the crown of the building. So not only is the top sculpted to simulate the mountains, it is also brought down at this graphic scale near the, near the podium. And even though this is a parking garage along 12th Street, urbanistically, we felt it was important that the tower expression continues down to the ground. Uh, 12th Street has our residential entry, and then there is active retail frontage along Idaho. Uh, moving to the ground, um, Idaho Street is along the left or along the right side. 12th Street is along the top. Uh, north is a little up and to the right, just to orient everyone. 
to our plan. Um, and so because we noticed that there is retail much further down on Idaho Street and kind of fills out the C5 district here, we felt it important to respect and continue that urban retail frontage uh, into our development. And this would activate our Idaho Street frontage with the retail. Then we thought that 12th Street is the quieter street, which is perfect for our residential lobby entrance. Adjacent to the lobby is the public garage access. Um, you will note that we have pulled back from the corner next to the alley. This is not only to respect the required view triangle, um, but also to avoid the canal that clips the corner of our property. Additionally, we widened the alley based on recommendations from the city um, and loaded our services down the alley. Uh, lastly, um, talking about the streetscape, we are following the the downtown design guidelines with the 16 foot wide sidewalk with trees and grates on both Idaho and 12th Street. The trees are class two trees spaced every 30 feet on center and the historic street lights are about 60 feet on center. The current location of trees and historic, and historic lights follow these standards and we would like to keep them where they are currently. So this concludes our presentation and we are happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Questions from the committee at this point for the applicant? Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this, is, uh, this is impressive, uh, and I appreciate the thought that you guys have put into this. Um, this will certainly be a an invigorating addition to the skyline. Um, and I think I, I have a couple of questions, mostly just more on the detail level. Um, as far as the, the screening on the parking garage goes, is that intended to have any sort of articulation? Will there be a variation in depth so it doesn't have the effect of just being a painted box? Um, or it, is it gonna have the effect of being a painted box? Uh, no, sir. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, certainly, that's not the intention. Um, we're, we're actually looking at uh, a high tensile fabric instead of the perforated metal. Um, we like the idea of bringing a natural light to the garage. Uh, you know, it is going to be a, a public commercial garage. So you know, having natural light um, is going to be a little bit more friendly to people when they come in. Um, and then the, the, as the light hits it, we think it will give it some texture um, with the fabric. Uh, on, the, on the top level of the garage, uh, some of your renderings show um, greenery up top, like probably level two trees. I'm not sure what the, the size is. Uh, I don't think we were provided with a plan for that particular level. Is that going to be just a standard residential level? Will there be um, another uh, pseudo public space for residents up there that to make use of the uh, the deeper floor plane up there? You're talking about right above the parking podium? Exactly. Yeah, so the idea there is to have some terraces for those units. <clears throat> um, we haven't figured out exactly how deep those are, but they're usually around 10 by 15, um, something sizable where you can lay out and put a sofa out there and a chair and a lounger. Um, we, it'd be great to have um, some, some trees there, but we are gonna have to be cognizant about how mature those trees are, you know, given structural loads and everything like that. Usually if we keep them by columns, that's a safe bet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Couple of questions real quick on the, the garage screening then. Or do you have sample, physical samples of what you're thinking, the different pieces of that? Yeah, we can options. provide some. Yeah. Um, and then how it terminates at the top, I guess, whatever that trim piece is, top and bottom, I think are gonna be kind of critical elements to kind of keep the, the purity of that portion of the box, as well as the transition between the two different colors, whether those are separate pieces or they're just uh, color changes on, on that piece. Um, the materials on the columns again, can you remind me that at the ground level as well? Sure, it, um, it's a wood-like veneer. Um, so they're intended to look like mass timber, you know, pillars. 
Uh, and then we've got some black metal frames uh, inside of those pillars. And then there's some louvers above that uh, for retail, like a restaurant that might move in. I know it's a little hard to see in the rendering. Maybe yeah, I can zoom in for you. But these, these columns right here uh, is a wood-like veneer that just kind of runs at every column bay. So they're spaced about 27 feet on center. So it gives you some nice rhythm as you walk down the block. And then there's some black frames in here, um, canopies that come out and engage uh, the sidewalk over here, and then a band for retail signage. Lighting strategies for the exterior of this building is that, so can you maybe walk, walk us through that too? I know you got a little bit of it shown um, of what, what the storefront level looks like. Yeah, um, so usually we'll put um, some sconces on the columns at every, all the bays. We do get a lot of light spill off from the retail. Um, <clears throat> we are gonna want some light for the residential lobby. And then we'll put some lights along the alley to make sure that it's safe at night. Um, we, we typically don't like to put lights on our residential buildings. It tends to, um, you, you get some angry neighbors and people, they, you know, they go to their unit to sleep. They don't, they don't want someone else's light on. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Simple. Um, what are, so the mechanical units for the structure, I would assume, you know, Lower level is going to be maybe handled on top of the garage and residential on the roof. You see any, I think you're here for the previous presentation, or at least caught a little bit of that work session. Are you doing, you know, wall mounted mini split systems? Are you doing air handlers on the roof? Um, just a little bit more detail yeah, on that. Sure. Yeah. Great question. So it, it'll be a cooling tower up on the roof. Um, and then we'll have vertical heat pumps uh, in all the units. And it's just four pipes that just run through the entire building and all the units sort of stack. So it's, it's a very, very clean um, building. We're trying to avoid anything kind of on the exterior with the exception of just operable windows and that horizontal band that you see on every floor line. Okay, great, thank you. Is there a, oh, go ahead and see, yep. Um, I'm sorry, can you clarify an earlier statement you said there were going to be trees or no trees on top of the parking deck on the top floor of that deck. Um, we'd like to locate some trees. They just, there probably won't be very, very mature trees that we have to be cognizant of the loads that are imposed on the, um, the garage. So it, when we put a tree, we'll put it on the column um, so that it just can come down to the ground a little bit easier. Um, but they, they're not, they're not going to be like the big trees that that you that you might expect at you know at the ground level or that are just growing um, near the green belt. So in your depiction that you have there, I mean, what kind of caliper are you thinking at that level? Um, I've seen these trees grow to you know 15, 20 feet. Um, but um, I, I think we'd be careful about them growing a little bit too large just just for safety reasons. Thank you. Do you have a plan view of that level? And it, maybe I have to have Josh pull up the, is that uh, eighth floor? Try to draw this here for you, but basically looks looks like that. So you got about um, ten to fifteen feet on the right. You've got fifteen feet on the left. Um, you know, the idea is to have some terraces on those floors so that people could walk out from their unit and enjoy the outdoors. And then where we can plant some vegetation and some smaller trees, you know, we'd, we'd like to do that. Gotcha. So it's mainly for use for just that level. 
Yeah, this gotcha. is not intended for um, the, the amenity level for the entire building is up at the very top. I'm kind of getting to this, a few of those balconies up higher. Um, can you kind of walk through the construction of those balconies and the railing system that's proposed? Looks like it's just a clear glass. That's but, correct. Yeah. yeah. So um, the building is all concrete. So it'll be about an eight inch concrete slab that's poured. Um, the balconies will also be concrete. Uh, and then it's just a, a simple glass guardrail with some metal posts um, and a metal top. Um, usually we like to go a little bit taller than code just because, you know, you're up pretty high <laughs> and it's windy. So we want people to feel safe up there. Obviously, there's a lot of glass on this building. Can you kind of walk through the glass system that's being utilized here? It looks like it's a front faced kind of. Um... Yeah, um, so it, it's a it's called a window wall system. So um, you install it at every floor line and it just sits on top of the slab. Um, and then uh, we're trying to get as much vision glass as you can. Um, in our experience, the whole the 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 one of the main drivers for living in a high rise is looking at getting these spectacular views. Um, you, you know, in this case, it's the foothills. And um, so we, we'd like to try to maximize as much glass as we can. That's vision. Uh, but we do understand the energy code and um, the constraints that we have and, and are going to have some certain, some are going to end up being spandrel. So there'll be um, the same glass. So it has the same reflective properties but we'll put a, a paint on the number four service so that you can't see inside. You anticipate on the top edge, the jagged edge of that, um, that same system basically, but is that just kind of cantilevered off the bottom or do you expect additional framework needed for the support of that on the backside? Yeah, so in our, our experience, you can probably um, do 12 feet um, without adding any additional metal or framework. Uh, so once you get to that point, you do have to kind of run a, a steel beam or, or some extra support. So uh, in that image there, you see to the left, that's our cooling tower well. Um, so we wanted to cover that up. That's probably going to be 30 by 30 piece. Um, so we'll have to run some additional steel in there or concrete to support that wall. Other questions from the committee at the, this time? Seeing none, thank you very much. And are there members of the public here wishing to testify towards this application here tonight? Yes, please come forward if you would and state your name and address for the record, if you would. I'm Scott Shaner with Raffinelli and Nehas uh, at 702 West Idaho, Suite 825. Uh, we own most of the land and the buildings to the north of this project. We just finished 11th and Idaho. So we probably have the most to lose as far as views. It's gonna take a lot of our views. But with that said, I'm, I'm here to support the project. I think it's a nice project. I think it's well thought out. Um, I think that in Boise, we've had, we've built a lot of buildings that have not um, been architecturally significant. And I think that this is some, easily the nicest residential building we've seen proposed in Boise, or at least that I've seen proposed in Boise. And then there's some other reasons. I mean, obviously housing, you know, everyone's talking about housing attainability. Some of it's just supply and demand and we need more units. And this provides in one big building, a lot of units. Um, second is, you know, downtown retailers, you know, we have some of those as tenants and they're struggling. It's been tough right now. Putting more people downtown will help that. It's going to help traffic. My wife and I, we live downtown and I work downtown and I rarely drive except to go to McCall on the weekends. And, and the same thing is going to happen here. People aren't going to pay rents for a building like this and work out at 10 mile. So it will reduce traffic. But most importantly, I think that the nice thing about this is, is that you've got a developer you can count on. 
Oppenheimer has been doing business here for a long time. I, I don't know the guys from White Oak. I actually just met him in the lobby. It seemed like nice guys. I've done a little research on them. They've built really nice stuff, it appears, from everything I've, I've seen. But as, as you guys know, as we go through the process, the construction process, there's lots of chances to VE things and to change plans and to make decisions. And I, I, I believe you can count on the Oppenheimers to make the right decisions and make sure that whatever gets built uh, even if even if it, it takes another year for the payback or whatever whatever that means, it, the right thing's going to get built, and I and that should be important to all of us. Thank you very much. Yep, appreciate it. Thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to testify tonight? If you're online. Please virtually raise your hand. Josh. Nobody. Yes, please. My name is Dan Everhart. I live at 200 North 3rd Street. Um, and you've heard me talk about another project. I, um, I'm super excited about this project since I live downtown. Um, I, I think the design aesthetic is engaging and interesting. I think it's high praise from Ref Nally Nahaus, who has been putting up the best buildings in downtown um, with the best design aesthetic. I, I wish all, I wish all downtown towers had the level of quality um, that, uh, that this design seems to, uh, to have. So um, I'm, I couldn't say more uh, to, to praise it. I think it's an exciting opportunity for Boise. It's certainly gonna add to our skyline in a way that's both, I think, dramatic and, um, and beautiful. So. I, I hope you'll approve this design as it's proposed. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other members with the public wishing to testify tonight? Seeing none, does the applicant have any other closing remarks or additional things you'd like to discuss? Seeing none, thank you very much. We will now close the public portion of the testimony, bring it back to the committee for discussion and consider motion. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Zavala. I'll, uh, I'll start the discussion here. Uh, uh, I agree with the latter comments that were made here by Mr. Shaner and uh, the last gentleman with regard to uh, the quality of the building and the design. Um, I think that what we're seeing uh, and what I'd like to see in that area is the, the new energy that the, these recent developments are bringing and extending uh, the downtown core to the uh, to the west, uh, and the, I think the inclusion of the retail on the first floor will continue to do that where there's a kind of a, a blank spot between 13th Street and 10th Street in there for good quality retail, which I think this building will bring. Um, and uh, uh, like I say, the, the quality of the design is exciting. I think just looking at the the uh, skyline of the, of the city, we're, we're seeing what Boise wants to be as we go down the road as far as the downtown core and the, the massing downtown. With that said, um, I, I would like, uh, as we consider uh, how to uh, vote on this particular project, uh, that we consider having the applicant return uh, at the end of the design review stage uh, for a public work session, uh, just so that we can have a better idea of the final detail materials, uh, including physical samples of those, and uh, any uh, design changes that uh, may have resulted as a result of this project moving forward. And with that, I'll yield the floor to anybody else with the comments. Great, thank you very much. Mr. Zavala. Chair. Yes. Um, I'd like to add or concur with Mr. Zavala and his comments. And if we ask um, the applicant to come back at a public work session, um, some things that are going to be of concern and I'm going to be looking for is I really want to know what's happening with the landscape uh, on top of that parking garage. If, uh, if you were here in the earlier testimony, um, that's going to be a big concern. You're showing us this beautiful trees. Is that what we're going to get at the end or as you do your design, you're going to determine, oh, it really only supports um, tall shrubs or whatever. So I'd like to see what's happening there. I think at the um, ground level, the materials 
um, what's happening at this pedestrian level. I'd like to see those materials in a little more detail on what's happening there. And also the lighting at the street level um, on the building sconces or whatever you're proposing there. Um, those are gonna be things I'm gonna be looking for or like to see. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Stead. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I think to follow up on the, the lighting at the ground level, um, I, similar to the earlier work session, I think it'd be important to see what the internal lighting on the parking garage looks like and does through that translucent screening. Um, and let's, let's make sure and add a couple of light bugs out on the periphery so we see what the illuminated skin of the building looks like as well. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Um, yeah, that I concur, I think, with all of my other fellow committee members. Um, it's an exciting addition. There looks like looks to be an exciting addition to the skyline of Boise. Um, the fabric on the garage um, is a unique treatment. That's definitely something that we'll want to see some more detail on at that work session. Um, and the landscape on the building, I think, is paramount. I mean, we're the city of trees. Um, it would be great to get some trees. There's not a lot of on structure landscaping here, um, which I think is unfortunate. I think that we there's an opportunity here to get that. And uh, especially on that top amenity space looks pretty incredible in the renderings and uh, look forward to see more detail on that to, that follows up with that design. I have no doubt that you can get to that point. Um, it's really what I have. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to concur with all the committee's uh, comments tonight. Uh, I think the building has a beautiful and uh, beautiful, simple form that's uh, very elegant. Um, do you believe that there's some additional detail that is needed for final approval? So I would be in support of uh, just bringing this back to a work session at a future date, um, just to just to get another uh, set of eyes on uh, exactly what's being proposed as this uh, project progresses. Um, Mr. Zabal, I didn't know. Did you prove, did you suggest a percentage or when that was uh, to be returned to us? Um, uh, I guess we typically do that at kind of a design development. Yeah. Stage or 50% <clears throat> drawings or would that be too far in, into it at that point? Uh, I don't want to get them so far that they're overly committed, uh, but they should have more more detail mm -hmm. than we have right now. Yep. Um, it starts to all the 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 client and the the design team are full, getting fully invested. They should get too far into the the design, but we need enough to be con uh, that we know what we're going to get. Okay, I think that probably provides them enough information for some of the comments that we've uh, provided tonight, as well as uh, what we're expecting to see, and we'll kind of let them work with staff on. Uh, that uh, kind of design development application uh, with refined details. But with that, uh, anybody want to take a stab at a motion or any other discussion? I feel like there's uh, a lot of support for this particular project. And Mr. Chair. Yes. Let's see if I can get it. I move approval of DRH 21-00369, um, subject to the terms and conditions contained within the staff report, including the site-specific conditions with the addition of a condition to return to the design review committee for a public work session at 50% design development. Yeah, that'd be fine, I think. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're applicable. Okay. So moved. Second. And second. Any discussion on the motion tonight from the committee? Seeing none. Victoria, please call the roll. Marsh. Aye. Zimbala. Aye. Aguilar. Aye. Simple. Aye. Kristen. Aye. All in favor, motion carries. All right, next item on our agenda is number four, it's DRH 21-00404, location is 3575 uh, Finley Avenue. 
It is to construct a new approximately 38,000 square foot aquatic center building with two swimming pools and associated support space on a property in a C3D zone. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Caitlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. So we have the subject property here located on the west side of Finley Avenue, south of Federal Way. Uh, so we have Fred Meyer over here um, and Walgreens over here to kind of orient you. Uh, the site plan locates the building toward the center of the site with a surface parking area along the south and vehicle circulation around the perimeter. The pool facility is a fabric tensile structure. Uh, the front facade includes a translucent, a translucent panel system. Um, and then the main entry is located at the southwest, which is emphasized by a prominent steel canopy. Uh, so this was at the Planning and Zoning Commission, and they approved the pool facility use uh, through a conditional use permit uh, this past Monday. Um, and they did direct that the driveway locations be approved by design review. Uh, so there was some concern by planning staff about the proximity of the south driveway here that's proposed. And then there's this existing shared driveway here. And I have some photos of that I can show you. So here is that existing shared driveway. Um, and that is used by this building uh, to the south, which is an industrial building, and they have their truck docks here. So what they do is they back, they back up into here to get their access to their truck docks. And we did receive comments from ACHD this week. Um, so just to summarize, they said that Finley is a local street and they don't have any policy for distance between driveways on local streets. Uh, their required distance from a driveway to an intersection on a local street is 75 feet, measured center line to center line. Uh, so they support not using the existing shared driveway um, based on the incompatible uses. Um, and they will approve the southern proposed driveway um, as shown here. They would approve this location uh, with a 24 foot wide width on that driveway. Uh, so to kind of uh, address uh, staff's concerns, the applicant has provided two solutions. Um, the first option provides approximately 52 feet from the south property line to the center line of the driveway. So that does provide a little bit more space between that existing driveway and their proposed driveway. And this alignment also allows that the driveway and the service drive are in a straight line. And then their second option moves the driveway even a little bit further to the north. So that's about 60 feet from the south property line to the center line of that driveway. But then the driveway has to turn to meet up with that service drive. So their preference would be the 52 foot wide option. Uh, so currently the, we have a condition B that says the driveway configurations shall be approved by the city of Boise and the Ada County Highway District. So staff has provided some language that you could use to modify that condition B um, with whatever option you choose, or if you have another option that you'd like to use. So just stating that the distance between the center line of that driveway and that south property line, so you could use the applicants 50 feet that they um, had suggested, or you could come up with another answer. Um, and I believe the applicant team uh, is also available to review this. Thank you, Caitlin. Questions for staff? Uh, Madam, or er, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I mean, yeah. um, Caitlin, what is the existing use of that building, or do you know to the south, like how often they're using that truck dock? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee member Semple, it is some kind of, I think, believe just warehouse use. And it sounded like the applicant thought that that wasn't used very often. Um, and then I'll also just comment that the speed limit on that roadway is 25 miles per hour. So it's not, not a very heavily trafficked roadway. Okay. Thank you. Kevin, can you, do you know what the uh, parking impact to the, both of those options? They both provide basically the same parking number. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, so their original proposal, all the parking is located here. Um, and then they had some thoughts for a future 
parking area over here um, if they do expand into this area here. Um, so by relocating the driveway further, uh, they've moved some of the parking over into this north area. Gotcha. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Caitlin, do you know if they had to move the building at all in order to gain that extra, extra space? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Committee Member Erstad, um, I believe they did shift the building north. Do we know roughly how far? Mm, I don't know the exact number. Any other questions for staff? Hearing none, is the applicant present? Would you like to come forward and uh, present? Or, and if you uh, would please state your name and address for the record. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and council members. Uh, my name is Mark Hazel. I'm with Lombard Conrad Architects, 472 West Washington Street. Uh, the facts that just Caitlin's presented them are, that's how we see it. We are looking at how we can possibly straighten out that south drive, uh, which is the primary frontage for the facility. That would, that straight drive would allow for better uh, bus access. The existing drive to the south, uh, as you can see, is beyond our property line or, or comes onto the property line. That drive right there is about 40 feet wide. Uh, so it has a very generous truck traffic area. The building to the south is a biotech research company from the signage. I don't entirely know what they what they do there, but I do not anticipate that they have a uh, lot of public visiting that site and that is primarily used for uh, public loading, or sorry, for truck loading and unloading to the south. Uh, we did push the building and the entirety of the site up north as much as possible. Uh, we are limited uh, with, with continuing to move the building north uh, due to the fact that in the future, if budget allows, we'd like to expand and, and put an outdoor swimming facility there, as well as additional parking to support that. Thank you. Question for the applicant from the committee. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, just one. Or I just wanted to confirm, are you, you're in agreement with the staff report and conditions of approval? Correct. I am uh, with the exception of, of the, you'd like to discuss the South Drive and if it's possible, uh, go with the 50 foot straight drive as opposed to the 60 foot. But yes, we are in, we are in approval. Your preference yes. is the 50 foot and not the one that curves it further away. Correct. Okay. Thank you. No other questions? Great. Thank you very much. The members of the public wishing to testify to this application tonight. Online, if you would please virtually raise your hand. Everybody online, seeing none. Uh, take it that the applicant doesn't have any other further remarks. Uh, with that, we'll close the public portion of the testimony, bring back to the committee for discussion and a motion. Caitlin, can you flip between those two driveway options? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, Mr. Zabala. Josh, or uh, question. Um, looking at the, the staff report, they indicated, the applicant indicated that at some point in time, uh, with the bleacher system and everything, they could have 675 people within this facility. And yet, the total parking spaces proposed uh, as determined by the director are only 41. Uh, is there a, are these people coming in buses or are they, oh, okay. Yeah. Is uh, that the intent? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, committee member Zabala, uh, generally there won't be that many people in the building. Those will just be occasional events and they're kind of working with the surrounding properties to have parking agreements in place to accommodate extra parking. And most of these, um, most of the competitors will be um, not driving age, I, I believe. So um, they'll come in buses and they won't all be in cars. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I am really in support of this project because it's something that we need in the community, but I'm struggling with the parking. Even if there's not a, a competition per se, I assume there's going to be practices. And I don't... I got to believe there's going to be a lot more um, participants 
practicing than what the parking as proposed allows. The other thing of concern is the fact that this is a sprung structure and it's, it's a temporary structure. It's not a permanent one. Um, and at some time it's gonna fail in the future, it's gonna or become degraded. And I'm familiar with this because of the structures at Tamarack, for example, I'm very familiar with those. So um, I'm struggling with those two things. And um, I know it's probably not feasible um, from a monetary standpoint to do a more permanent structure there. Um, but I guess I just want it for the record that I'm not in support of a sprung structure being used as a permanent building. Thank you. Okay. Other comments from the committee? Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I just comment on the parking? Yes. Um, just to clarify, this did have a conditional use permit that reviewed the parking already and it was approved. Um, so that really does um, not need to be within your re review tonight. Gillen, do you mind flipping to the floor plan real quick too? So. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, did you say the floor plan? Yes, please, okay. thank you. Thank you, and the elevations one, one time too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or staff or? Thoughts on the permanence of the structure pieces? Um, do you believe the fabric itself can be replaced as a maintenance item? Obviously there's some cost to those. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Do we know what the structure of the the structure itself is made of is that uh, painted steel is that an aluminum uh, are we going to have to worry about uh, corrosion corrosion of any sort I mean you, you always have to worry about corrosion of some sort right <laughs> yeah I don't know Caitlin was that identified in the application if that's a yeah, I don't know if that was identified in the application uh, they did provide a manufacturer or a company they were working with we might be able to bring that up Can we get the applicant to maybe? Yeah. Do we want to open up the public portion real quick yeah. again? And make that application. You all fine with that? Uh, at this time, we'll open up the public or back to the public for testimony. And if the applicant uh, would mind coming forward, have a couple of questions. Questions, I think we're on the permanence of the fabric material and then the actual substructure material. If, those, if you could provide some insight onto those two pieces. Yes, to, uh, to, uh, to Commissioner, or sorry, to uh, Committee Member Aguilera's point, it is a temporary fabric structure. Uh, it does have a very long lifespan, but will need to be replaced. It is not a permanent structure, but due to cost for what is essentially a, a public private facility or utilizing public funds, the primary goal is to provide a uh, competitive level swimming event space, uh, collegiate level swimming level swimming space uh, for the public, for the for Boise. And we are trying to do this in an efficient way where we are providing a, a the primary, putting the primary funds into the pool facility itself and the sprung structure will be um, adequate to support the pool facility and the operations. Uh, the fabric structure will be needed, will need to be replaced at a certain time and, and will be replaced. Uh, the substructure has been used in several other uh, aquatic facilities, one that we're currently doing uh, in Mountain Home, Leckard. It is a structure that is designed to withstand the corrosive uh, nature of a pool facility. Uh, as well as we are providing appropriate HVAC to help control and mitigate the humidity within. 
Thank you. Other questions for the applicant, Melissa? Uh, when you say that it, it is, what, what, what is the anticipated lifespan of the fabric? So the anticipated lifespan of the fabric is, uh, as I think as they listed, is, is 15 to 20 years. Thank you. Other questions? None. Thank you very much. Again, we'll open up to the public. Anybody in the public wishing to testify to any of these items? Seeing then we'll close the public portion of the testimony and bring it back to the committee for additional uh, discussion and uh, entertaining a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Uh, I guess the two major concerns that the committee has has been voiced. Uh, they're really, uh, not much we can do to affect those decisions of as far as the uh, applicant and is involved and what they they want to invest in this structure and the risks involved and the decisions they're making today uh, i agree that it's a it'll be a great facility for the city and for the swim teams that are around so uh, with that uh, i would recommend uh, approval of drh 21-00404, subject to the finding of fact, conclusions of law and the site specific conditions of approval uh, with the modification of uh, item B, uh, revised per the staff requirement for the straight in 50 foot distance uh, to the parking lot. So moved. Second. Seconded, any discussion on the motion? All right, with that, uh, Victoria, please uh, call the roll. Marsh. Aye. Zabala. Aye. Aguilar. No. Simple. Aye. Erstead. Aye. Motion carries, four in favor, one opposed. Next item to be heard tonight is item number five. It's DRH 21-00405, location is 8208 South Eisman Roads for the construction of a new approximately 48,800 square foot industrial building with associated site improvements. Located in a property in an M1D zone. And again, I'll turn uh, this over to you, Caitlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, so this subject parcel is the southern half of this outlined area, which is approximately five acres, and it was broken off of this larger piece. Um, and it is under the same ownership and use. The property is on the east side of Eisenman Road, south of Gowan Road, across the street from the Blue Valley community. Uh, so this is the approximate location of the proposed uh, 48,800 square foot manufacturing building. Uh, here we have the site plan. Uh, north is on your left. The building is being placed near the rear of the property with a small surface parking area in the front. The applicant will provide a portion of the parking on the adjacent property through a shared parking agreement. Uh, the access drive is proposed to align with Blue Lake Lane. There's a second driveway labeled as a future access drive. A recommended condition of approval states that the secondary driveway is not approved with this application uh, because city policy encourages consolidating driveways and Eisenman is an arterial roadway. Uh, and then the service drive will need to be paved and configured to provide all required fire access. The applicant will also be constructing new sidewalk along Eisenman Road, as well as installing a front landscape buffer with street trees. A condition of approval states that the only screen store that only the screen storage areas can be gravel and that any other areas are required to provide a mainly vegetative ground cover. Uh, and that includes the area between the sidewalk and the street. Uh, the building is typical of an industrial building with a uh, gray PBR metal siding, a metal roof, um, and overhead doors. Here's a rendering of the building. Um, and then you should have received a memo with the comments from the South Eisenman Neighborhood Association. They have a concern about the erosion and runoff from this property into the Blue Valley uh, Community Lake. Um, and the applicant team did provide a response with some ideas of how this will be mitigated. Uh, and that includes the addition of the landscape areas and some other site improvements are, that are part of their project. 
So I believe the applicant team is available to speak, and I believe the South Eisenman Neighborhood Association also has some representatives here tonight. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Questions? Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, just for Caitlin, is the applicant in agreement with all of the conditions of the staff report? Um, Mr. Chairman, committee member Simple, there may be a condition or two that they'd like to speak about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, is the applicant present? Would you like to please, if so, please come forward and uh, state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Design Review Committee. My name is Cornell Larson. My address is 210 Murray in Garden City. I'm here tonight representing the applicant uh, on the project. Uh, we are in general to, uh, compliance with the conditions or we're in agreement with the conditions. We did have a couple of ones that we wanted uh, to uh, speak about, and that was the uh, ADA access to the sidewalk. We have a totally fenced site out there that's secure that we don't necessarily allow the public to come in and, and wander around. Uh, so we were a little bit concerned about putting a sidewalk out there and then fencing it out. Um, but in general, they anybody that's on that site that comes to that site, uh, it's escorted around the site. They're not uh, allowed to just wander freely in there. Uh, the reason for this building is they are out of space for manufacturing. They've been successful. They need more space to to work in. Um, the building's a pretty simple building. Uh, we're willing to work with staff on the uh, east elevation that uh, needs a little more dressing up according to the conditions. So we're willing to do that. Uh, we did uh, receive a letter that uh, Caitlin had forwarded, forwarded to us on the uh, neighbor's concerns of uh, drainage running down into their lake. And as you know, we're required typically by code to contain the, the storm water off of the site on and contain it on the site, not allow it to run off the site. So we plan on complying with that code section. Now, there could be runoff going down uh, Eisman Road that's on Ada County right away that may also be contributing to that condition that we can't really do anything about at this time. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Questions for the applicant from the committee? No. None. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. Did you have any um, proposals for the east elevation as far as spicing it up? Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Erstad, I think that what we might do is uh, pop a little bit of that facade out of um, eight inches or a foot or so, and then change the color on it, and maybe change the direction of the metal to give it a little character. Maybe a canopy over the one or two of those entry doors that are out there. Those are typically conditioned by the fire department that we need an access point on an industrial building about every hundred feet. So we have those as more fire access doors. Any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the neighborhood Association representative. And if you would please state your name and address for the record. Bonnie Hardy, 8301 Blue Heaven Lane. Boise, Idaho, 83716. And um, we're here representing South Eisenman Neighborhood Association. I want to thank you for letting us come in and speak, sir, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, and also the committee. Um, one of the first things we want to bring up is Boise had adopted a code, the best neighbor uh, code, and it actually requires a checklist to be completed. And one of the things on 
that code is that they would have a neighborhood meeting that would not have city people there, that the business would notify the neighborhood association. They have specific days of the weeks and hours that they can have the meeting. And this is the whole idea. I think we wouldn't be here right now if we were able to have that meeting where we had an open communication without taking up your time. So some of the concerns that we're gonna to address today are definitely the erosion and uh, how the sidewalk is gonna be placed because we do have a limited two lane road out in front. So there's no pedestrian safety. The uh, shoulder of the road is non-existent in some areas. And also we're going to address the lighting situation as it is currently because we didn't notice any lighting uh, addressed in the proposal. And I, we did notice that public works did require a drainage plan submitted prior to approval. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Ron take it over and we have some pictures as you can see of some erosion. For, for the record. Yep, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm Ron Piccinelli. I'm the president of the South Eisman Neighborhood Association, 2247 Blue Lake Lane, Boise, Idaho 83716. We have a few graphic representations of what has been occurring along Eisenman Road. Um, the one, the prior slide uh, shows the actual erosion along the um, Trinity Trailer property. This is due to be done. Uh, this is part of the project before you. Uh, and this has been going on for quite a while, as you can see, it's uh, quite a bit of, and some pretty good gullies going down there and a lot of uh, silt washing in. Uh, the next slide is a project that was just approved about two years ago. This is the RNL trucking project also along Eisen Road. This is south of the uh, Trinity property. And this just happened in the space of a year. So you need to do something else besides just dig a culvert. It's not, it's not cutting it. It's cutting up, but then it's just eroding afterwards. The third slide, is a slide of the Jack's Tire and Oil and Gas, which is adjacent to Trinity Trailer. You can see they've done some planning in it and it hasn't eroded at all. This seems to work. So this is maybe part of the design of the project to get an actual workable culvert that doesn't actually wind up in our lake at the end. Uh, that's our main concern. We also have some concern about lighting and we have we're doing a tag team here <laughs> and uh one of our board members wants to address that Great. thanks Who would please state your name and address for the record yes yep. my name is linda puccinelli 2247 blue lake lane and i am a board member of the south iceman association neighborhood association Oh, okay. This picture here is I am standing on the end of Blue Lake Lane in front of a home that you will see in a moment. And this is a brand new light that has been placed up probably within the last six weeks or so. It's an LED. It is so bright that coming off of Blue Lake Lane driving at night, it literally blinds you. I have, I had to stop. The first time this became apparent, I had to stop and ask my husband, where is the road? It totally blinds you. Uh, other neighbors have bumped into the same problem. And what they do is they drive to other ends of the park, go all the way around, so they don't have to come out on that road because they cannot see the road. Um, this is, as I say, you can see it's a short distance from the home where I'm standing, and you will see more indication of that on a future slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just showing where the light is. It's essentially 
just as that new road they're going to extend across from Blue Lake Lane, it's a uh, light pole and um, and there's two lights. There's one the light pole, and then you will see another one. They also mounted a similar light on the edge of a building that is to, as you're looking at this, it's to the further uh, north. So, uh, next. and the one thing about them is they are 24 seven. They're not on a timer. Uh, you will see later how bright it is even in the daytime. Now I'm standing under the pole of that light that you saw in a previous picture. This is the home and you can see how close that home is to that light. Those are the um, woman's two bedroom windows. That's the only two bedrooms you have. As you can see standing from that light pole, you can actually see in those bedroom windows. And at night, she has to put a dark shade across because that light is shining right into her home. And the quality of her living in her home is uh, greatly uh, disturbed. Next slide, please. These are two homes on Blue Lake Lane. And the back of those homes, you can barely see Trinity, but if you look between the homes, uh, Trinity has a whole, and I have a future picture, a whole host of lights across uh, the, uh, their buildings that face Eisenman. None of them appear, or most of them appear, they do not have any shading, they do not face down, they face out, right into our residence, backyards, and often um, you'll see another picture where it goes right into the front of their homes. And um, so this lighting is been an ongoing problem. And with these addition of the two lights, it's become a critical problem. Next slide. This is the one light right across from Blue Lake Lane. This is in the middle of the day. And uh, you can see how bright it's showing even in daylight hours. Um, it kind of looks like kind of, uh, it never turns off. It's kind of a down and dirty. And um, it has the, LED facing in all directions. So it's uh, affecting all the homes across the street. Next uh, slide, please. This is the other light. It didn't show on the diagram to the north. And you can see the different values. You have more of a warm light up higher to the left, and then you have another exact type LED light. And two things is, the LED light, once again, I will show you a picture right across the street. I'm standing by the homes. It's shining right into their homes. Now, all the other lighting that was pre-existing, uh, that one light to the upper left, it is so bright and doesn't go down, doesn't have shielding. That's the one that goes all the way through uh, a storage area our street and into people's backyards and homes. We really need to have the lighting situation addressed for existing and these new two lights and therefore any future lighting. Like uh, Amazon and others, this was an issue and they were required to put down lighting. And um, I think this needs to be addressed here for us. Next slide. Okay, now I'm standing where you saw those lights. I'm standing up against the fence, which is in front of those buildings. And these are homes that those lights at night that you saw how bright that light was right into their homes and backyards. Uh, in fact, one of them, the one that I said that's going into the backyard, uh, it's one street over her sewing room at night is lit up by it. That's how powerful these lights are. Next. This is an overview of our residential area. There's about 200 homes and there's a quality of life, life that we continually, uh, we try to work with the commercial and um, many cases they've done wonderful jobs. We have no complaints. But in this particular situation, 
it the project due to the erosion the situation the lighting situation uh is really affecting the quality of life of uh, our neighborhood again just to summarize it it is the erosion the fact that a sidewalk would be put over there without any type of studies because the the picture of RNL has the sidewalk on top and you see how it's roading and there's no uh, drainage system. Mr. Gas on the very far end, the south end of Eisenman, they put in a pretty nice drainage system and they also draped it with, you could see it was going to turn into some grass. But as you can see from the picture, our lake is usually blue like that. And uh, it's definitely not just Trinity. There's a drainage problem there. But hopefully C C CCDC is working with us currently. And they have an engineer that's going to engineer our side of the road for sidewalks. And uh, hopefully we can get it on both sides where it's not eroding and polluting our lake. Appreciate. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Are there other members of the public who wish to testify on this application tonight? Online, virtually raise your hand. Anybody online, Josh? Hearing none. Would the applicant like to make any uh, remarks? Please feel free to come up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Cornell Larson. Um, we uh, we think that what we've got planned for the landscape and the sidewalk there will help contain uh, erosion, but we'll have our landscape people look at that a little more closely. Uh, we are happy that the Neighborhood Association likes the Mr. Gas project because that was one of ours. So um, the, um, the lighting situation is one that is probably existing on the existing buildings. The new building would actually have the compliant downlight. Um, my client said he's more than willing to meet with the association to discuss the lighting, so that would be available. We could talk to them afterwards if, if they were so willing. And um, you know, as far as the best neighborhood practices, we're not necessarily required to have a neighborhood meeting with the design review application. So at this point in time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good. Questions for the applicant? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we'll close the public portion of the uh, hearing here and bring it back to the committee for discussion. Question for you, Caitlin. Can you go to the site plan one more time for me, real quick? So is this are there two different parcels? Is this a separate parcel from the existing structure or existing portions of it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. They broke off a five acre parcel from that existing larger parcel. And then all the improvements are occurring on that south parcel, except for that driveway improvement and some landscaping at the corner there. Okay. And the, do we know they have full shielded lights on the new application for? Yeah, Mr. we do have a condition on the new portion that they're doing um, for any existing lights that are not in compliance. They can submit a code compliance uh, complaint if the applicant is or the owner is not working with them to get those lights to shine downward. Okay. And code enforcement works on the parcel to the, what is that, uh, north? Oh, okay, thank you. Are there items of discussions, questions? Anybody want to take a stab at a motion? Yep, appears like there's are some probably some of the photos, some non-conforming lights that are uh, shining directly towards the neighborhood. So uh, we'd certainly encourage 
the applicant to talk with the owner to uh, resolve that issue. Uh, but since that is on the adjacent parcel, if needed, go through the route as uh, Caitlin had indicated to uh, talk to code enforcement. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. I, along those same lines, I think the same thing with that erosion issue. I mean, and even if it's occurring on the existing site frontage, that's a major problem. Um, not just for this community that is invested in having their lake um, not be polluted with runoff like that, but just in general, uh, best practices, that's not something that I would ever wanna see regardless of location. So I would highly encourage the applicant to remedy that as quickly as possible. And the neighborhood association, if that's within the right of way, um, talking to ACHD about that is, and city of Boise has erosion control uh, permitting and inspectors that will definitely go out and inspect that type of thing as well. Very simple. Other comments, questions? Motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. I would move to approve DRH 21-00405 as recommended in the findings of fact, conclusions of law and recommended conditions of approval noted in the project report. Okay, so moved. Second. Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seen. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Just to follow up on my motion uh, for approval. Um, Again, that is not to gloss over anything that needs to be addressed by the applicant um, on existing structures, existing issues within the roadway. Um, I'm hoping that they do take the opportunity, they've indicated that they will, to have a discussion with the Neighborhood Association to alleviate those issues. Um, this neighborhood has dealt with a lot in the last couple of years. Um, we've all been a part of that, or most of us sitting up here were a part of that too. So. I commend their motivation to be involved. Um, and so I, I hope that that's not lost on the applicant either. Um, they deserve to be, to get what everyone else does. So that's all. Um, we're fine just requiring the ADA access to the, uh, the front door. I think that was the only other item that the applicant was uh, wanting to discuss. Which... I think, Mr. Chairman, I think that's just a general condition yep. that's put on all projects. So I don't know that we can really deviate from that, in my opinion. Okay. Other thoughts? Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, the, the public portion of this has been closed. Sorry. <laughs> Any other discussion on the motion? All right, Victoria, please call the roll. Marsh. Aye. Bala. Aye. Aguilar. Aye. Semple. Aye. Kristen. Aye. All in favor, motion carries. Okay, thank you. And that concludes our items for our regularly scheduled hearing for tonight. And at this time, we will reopen the um, work session items. Give a couple of minutes for everybody to get situated. All right, Mr. Chairman, I think everyone is, is kind of back in the room. Just as a refresher, um, you had finished up public testimony. It's kind of up to you if you want to continue some public testimony um, and see if anybody wanted to speak more, or you could go into deliberations if you felt like 
you had received the information you need. So I'll let you uh, take it from here. Thank you, Josh. Does any member, any member of the committee want to uh, continue with any other public testimony tonight? If so, we, uh, I believe you already, what's that? Yes, Mr. Kristen. Um, as this is my first work session, I'd just like to get clarification on what that would entail as far as going back to public testimony. Does that mean that the project as a whole is up for discussion, at least within the parameters of the, the work session? Um, and does that essentially start us back at square one in terms of public testimony, uh, committee testimony, and questioning? Uh, or does that kind of put us back at, you know, like square three and a half, where we're just about to come to a decision? Um, for my own edification, would you? Briefly go into that. Yeah, I believe the uh, and Josh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. That uh, we still have the opportunity to take a little bit more public testimony. And uh, at this time, if we are going to take it from the applicant, we'd also open it up to the public. We had uh, already taken public and applicant um, testimony, so we do have uh, at this time could close the public portion of the testimony and just bring it back for deliberation. Thoughts? Anybody have questions for applicant or anything uh, further that we need to, or would you guys rather to jump right into discussion? Yeah. What's that? Nothing. I'm pretty sure. That's okay. Hearing none. Uh, desire for to um, have further uh, testimony from the application or applicant or the public. We will close the public portion of the. Um, the hearing here and bring it back to the committee for discussion, deliberation, and uh, motion. Back to my notes here. A um, couple of things. I uh, do appreciate the applicants um, with the additional residential units. I think that was a good solution um, for what they have put in there. Um, I do have a question, Josh, on the sign application pieces. Um, are they going through a sign program or at this time, is it just a standard sign applications um, like at any other project? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this property is not large enough to qualify for a sign application. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe it has to be two acres to qualify for a sign, per program. sign program. So they would just apply for individual sign permits and it would just be per the square footage allowed in the zone. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Is now the time to comment on how that doesn't necessarily seem like the most pertinent uh, requirement with a vertical use? Uh, um, probably isn't, but I think it's just important to raise that within our the context of our code. Mr. Chairman, uh, Committee Member Erstad, I, I think that's fair commentary. I mean, the sign ordinance, you know, is what it is, and it's not up for debate tonight. But, um, you know, I think commentary on on that is, is appropriate and and can influence how we move forward. You know, you you probably know we're rewriting our code. We're going to relook at these things and we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chair. Yes, Mr. Simple. Um, yeah, touching on the sign stuff, too, and I think. We got a little bit of feedback from the applicant regarding, you know, they just identified some locations they could put signs. Not that all of them would have signs. I think that it would, we'd be hard pressed to approve every single sign location that they showed with a sign on it. Um, I don't know if those boxes made up 20% of the facade of that whole building, but to me, that seems a little busy if they were going to propose that. So. I don't know if there's anything in our code that would preclude it, but um, just based on testimony from the neighborhood, um, I guess, you know, you'd, you'd be optimistic about the applicant not wanting to try to cram as many signs on there as they could, but um, just kind of my thoughts on that. Thank you, Mr. Simple. Um, and a few other things came up on the discussion was the garage screening. Um, I, I think I understand and, and respect each kind of view. Um, I think there was some desire to have additional vertical, I guess, uh, framework for enclosing some of the screening on the outside of the structure. Do you see the applicant's desire to have the building form itself kind of continue down to the ground with a consistent banding that's uh, uh, up above? Um, I. 
I'm personally fine with uh, what has been um, submitted tonight for that portion of the screening. Mr. Chair. Yes, I would agree with that. I think that my concern was primarily for the north side um, with the original application. And they did come back with some additional planter boxes that allow for shorter time frame to get that vegetation up the building. And I feel like the corner of 4th and Idaho with the vertical component of the plantings within those planter boxes, it accomplishes that similarly because there are boxes on every level of that parking garage. Um, I also feel like they're a little bit deeper than the ones that are on the exterior of the building. Um, so they could provide for a little bit more of substantial uh, planting. And, you know, really there's, they've got the, the wall and the planter to help screen lights coming from out inside there. I guess I'm in agreement that that wasn't really as much as my, of my concern as the north. And then the east sides, which then it was mitigated by the additional residential units. Otherwise, I appreciate the applicant bringing in the materials, uh, kind of outlining the uh, VTAC um, and being in the dark colored metal. I think that does conceal those uh, in a tasteful way. Um, all the other kind of comments I heard tonight to some of the no balconies on the new units. Uh, I think we just kind of saw another application that didn't have many for exterior options. And with both of those projects having other outside uh, outdoor uh, amenity areas for the residents. I'm fine with that uh, solution uh, that as presented by the applicant tonight. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, with regards to the um, materiality and uh, the balconies in particular, um, I think it would behoove this project from a conceptual and overall aesthetic standpoint to include that faux wood material that is uh, applied to the underside of the soffits underneath the balconies uh, as a continuation of that design language. Um, I don't know that this is necessarily something we can acquire of them, um, but uh, it's certainly something that I think would dramatically improve the uh, street level experience of this project. Yep. I agree with you that I think yeah, from street level looking vertically, that is a, a plane of surface that you see more of. So I think that, uh, again, I don't know that it's uh, uh, something that I would condition, but something maybe I would suggest, but I'm open to what uh, the other committee members think about that as well. Otherwise, I think... Uh, They've done a, a good job putting this together. I do appreciate the kind of the three-dimensional uh, presentation to be able to walk around the building and see it from multiple facets. I think that's very helpful for us. So I appreciate the effort uh, on that regard. Lighting's kind of tough to guess to me what it's really going to look like. I think people can have a good idea that there are going to be lights within the structure that are that are facing out. Um, And as stated, that garage level is rather high as well from the street level. So, you know, pushing a lot of these materials, those things are actually fairly detached vertically from the pedestrian experience. So I feel a little better about that as well. Um, I think I would encourage the applicants from any of the lighting that's uh, on the uh, inside the garage. Um, to try to keep the fixture itself from being visible from the street level or across the street from direct view uh, whenever possible. I don't know that that's a condition at this time, but uh, as well as uh, being aware of those two entrance exits where, uh, um, where you do want lighting for safety reasons, but to uh, try to keep the light from spilling out over and being uh, being a nuisance. So those are my thoughts. Any other thoughts from the committee member or anybody want to entertain a motion on the work session tonight? Mr. Chair, just one last question for staff. Uh, Josh, on the, uh, uh, we know that the plant materials on the, the north side are gonna be, is the uh, um, ivy. 
and yet it's undetermined yet on the uh, east side and nor north side or the east side what the inboard planting materials will be is that something that the staff once the applicant has got more information on that will provide to you and you have somebody qualified to look at it to determine if it's appropriate and viable Mr. Chairman, that is a level of detail that we will review with building permits. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we will have a complete building package that would include the plant materials in those. Um, if there are some specific parameters you would like placed around those plants in terms of height, you know, a mix of evergreen and deciduous, um, you know, include those in a condition. We certainly can look at that at the building permit stage. Make sure an appropriate mix has been provided based on your comments. Okay, that's fine. Any other thoughts, things that need to be discussed prior to uh, someone taking a stab at a motion? Seems like for the most part, the applicant did a pretty good job trying to address all of these things, a few items for the applicant to consider um, as uh, brought up by a public por portion of the testimony concerning the signages and uh, the phonometrics. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, with the help of staff here, I have a suggested motion. Uh, I would move to approve the work session drawings dated and received on October 4th, 2021. And per the discussion and findings contained in the work session memo for the hearing dated November 9th, 2021. Yep, so moved. Discussions on the motion. Second. Seconded. Yeah, we can have discussion on the motion. Sorry about that. No discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman. I think this building is rife with missed opportunities. And uh, if I were to start all over on it, I probably would. That said, uh, I don't think there's anything within our purview right now that can uh, necessarily stop it moving forward. So um, I wish we could do better here, but uh, I don't control the property and I was not contracted to design it, so. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Hearing none, uh, Victoria, please call the roll. Marsh. Aye. Zabala. Aye. Aguilar. Aye. Simple. Aye. Ersted. No. Motion carries four in favor, one opposed. And with that, we'll close the work session for tonight. And with that, we are also adjourned. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate all the comments and testimony. Good evening.